In our search for a Sabre, we ended up crossing paths with this beautiful Rolls-Royce Merlin Mark III. Worldwide, there's only a few dozen Sabre engines, and most of them are crash-recovered displays in museums and really hold little value if you're looking to rebuild to an operable condition or airworthy condition. Uh, I would suggest that there's less than a dozen in all conditions that have the potential to operate again. Most of those are preserved and held by museums and tell the story of the unique sleeve valve system and the development of the Sabre engine throughout the war. There are a few in private hands, and that's really where I started to look in our, our search for something that would have uh, value for rebuild. Back in 2019, I approached the owner of a Sabre 7 in New Zealand uh, with a request for consideration of sale, trade, or otherwise donation with wishful thinking of the Sabre II Typhoon Legacy 4 JP843. The response I got was that there would be consideration in the effort to preserve aviation history should I be able to provide a running Rolls-Royce Merlin from a Spitfire, preferably, uh, in trade. Rolls-Royce Merlin III, serial number 7757, it was built uh, June 21st, 1939, so it's a, a pre-war built Rolls-Royce Merlin, and it is indeed the variants that would have been used in the uh, ferry battle, the Hawker Hurricane, and the Spitfire during the time frame of the Battle of Britain. With our best efforts in uh, tracing the history of this engine, we believe it was intended for use in a ferry battle and would have likely come to Canada with the ferry battles early in the war as either a spare engine or in a, an aircraft. We just can't um, actually find records that show that it went into that. Uh, in our search for the Merlin, we were looking at a couple different ones that were available, and I really do think that we got very lucky with this one. It, it ended up being internally very, very well preserved from back in wartime. Um, and that really allowed us to move forwards with the engine with a lot less difficulty than we potentially could have had. Yeah, the preservative was uh, was something bizarre. It was like, uh, it was the best preservative I've ever seen and actually had coal tar in it sort of thing. So it was on everything. And that was the thing saving grace to actually save that engine was so much of that black goo, I call it, inside. The first significant milestone would be when we 
disassembled the engine and found it was in such great shape to actually be a viable project. Part of the conditions of the Merlin project were that we deliver the engine operable on a trailer for transport. And to do that, you've got to build all the systems and everything into the trailer. So being a, a frugal fellow like I am, I figured I'd go out and buy an old trailer and rebuild it. So I actually bought a horse trailer from the 1970s, a dual axle, 3,500 pound axle. So it met the criteria and the weight requirements and all that stuff. Um, and I think I paid 220 or $230 for it and brought it back here, essentially trashed the entire body of it, and then found out that really the frame and a lot of the things that I wanted to keep off of it to save money were either corroded or too corroded for use. So I stripped it of the, the valuable parts, I guess, or the um, higher quality parts from the, the 70s as opposed to new bought stuff today, like the axles and, and all those assemblies. So essentially I ended up with a set of axles and I kept the fenders off of it. And I think I had to pay about 700 bucks for sandblasting to clean everything up and bring it back to a state that I could work with it and make sure that it was delivered in good condition. So um, in hindsight, I probably would have bought them. Uh, all these, the components that I used brand new, but they probably wouldn't have been as good quality as the older stuff as, as well. So what I had to do then, was build a brand new frame, put the axles and suspension and all that stuff on there, and then build a mount for the engine. And it, it seemed simple. It's one of those things, ah, oh, that'll take a couple of days, but it was quite a chore to do. And uh, it's one of those phases that on social media, people are really not interested, but it's part of the commitment to getting this done right. The trailer turned out really well. It's essentially all new fabrication, all new steel, heavy wall stuff. So it's going to last for another 80 years for sure. Um, and we ended up with a, uh, a suspension issue later on where the suspension was binding. So all the springs that I kept from that old trailer as well ended up getting scrapped and we put some new ones on there and solved that issue. With the trailer, one of the very few things that I kept was actually the fender guards. They had a really nice uh, vintage aluminum checker pattern on them, very fine, and they looked great when they weren't polished. So I'd put them aside and when I was ready to install them, I brought them out and started polishing them only to find that there was lots of really small nicks that you couldn't see when it was dirty that really rendered them useless. So they went for scrap and I ended up building a new set of fenders. So I, I had to come up with a design and I, I thought that one of the best things to do would be to answer what the most common questions would be for the owner of the engine by embossing them on the fenders themselves. So. Uh, the first thing was to do copper Rolls-Royce uh, pressings on the fenders, and they turned out absolutely beautifully. Um, and the second thing was Merlin 3. So on the top, I did an aluminum Merlin 3 because I didn't want to take the attention away from the, the copper pressings on the front that were really the, the uh, centerpiece of the fenders and tied everything together. Uh, to assemble the fender guards, I made uh, trim pieces. It was quite a bit of uh, welding and cutting. It was all made from strap aluminum finished them to fit exactly. I embossed the uh, the main panel uh, with the bead roller and then riveted all the assemblies together with um, copper rows to tie the copper and the aluminum together. And they turned out fantastic. So it, I've actually become very proud of them and always very worried about them in the shop here. So fenders are on now and they, hopefully they'll uh, they'll be loved in their new home as well. A big setback that we had with the engine was uh, June of 2022. And that's when we actually figured that we were getting ready to start it. And as part of that process, we filled the engine with coolant and uh, found out that we had a leak. And it wasn't just a leak that was leaking coolant outside of the block. It was a leak that was had our coolant draining into the oil pan and into our oil system, which was, um, I think, catastrophic really at that point very disappointing and quite a setback for us. Um, but ultimately, it, it wasn't as bad as we thought to fix it. And uh, that's uh, with help from Peter Grieve in the UK. Um, we were able to identify the problem and also find the spare parts and get instructions on what to do from him uh, based on his extensive experience on them. What it was, was in the uh, the cylinder block, these are a monoblock on the early Merlins, there's a uh, drain tubes that return the oil down into the uh, crankcase from the cams. And 
uh, these they're a brass drain tube and when they flow down through the the blocks or the monoblock they pass through the water passage and we had found out through pressure testing that one of ours had cracked and uh we need to needed to investigate but to do that we had to pull the block off the engine and uh, kind of go back to square one on that side so we pulled the block and um it was interesting that all the seals were were brand new at 80 years ago the tubes were all brand new everything was in excellent condition it wasn't a corrosion issue that we feared uh, being an older engine um what it appeared to be was that th this tube when it was installed was compressed and it, when it was compressed likely during fitting the block to the crankcase it buckled the tube inside so when the tube buckled it split and that's what let our cooling system and oil system merge now with the block removed if that was a straight tube it would have been fairly easy to extract it <laughs> and replace it with a new tube and new seals and put everything back together the problem we had was with that buckle in there we actually had to slowly pull the tube grind away at it pull the tube grind away at it because it couldn't travel out the passage straight so it took us a couple days of messing around i believe uh, to get that out of there and we ended up with what was essentially shrapnel left over um and a big job cleaning that block up, uh, making sure that all of the um, debris from the removal <laughs> was actually removed. Um, with that, though, we and because we had the block off of the engine, we replaced all the seals, we replaced the new tube, and we reinstalled it. After we tried to get it started, we found out that the both banks, A and B, were grounded on the Magneto. We couldn't get any stuck of sparks out of it, so we disassembled and took them off the engine laid it out with all the wiring harness and we spun them up with a drill and that's when we found that they would actually produce uh, a spark so we put them back on again and the a1 worked perfectly the b bank that was the one that was with it um didn't work yep. it took it apart put it out together and it sparked perfect and the last big milestone of course is when it when it came to life and I would, did my happy dance <laughs> behind this thing because it was just like, it was so sweet when it started up. It was crazy, yeah. We had a problem with an oil cooler that we had on the engine here. Um, and it just wasn't, I'm going to say it wasn't big enough capacity to allow that much oil because there's the two inch inlet on the oil line here from the tank to the engine. So you can imagine how much oil is screwing back and it just wasn't enough flow through that cooler to, uh, to, to do the job. So we piped it right straight back into the tank without the cooler and the oil runs great. And the other problem we had with it was we didn't have a, uh, a fuel pressure regulator on the engine to start off with. We were just going between the fuel pump and to the carburetor. And the problem was we had too much flow there and it was actually hydraulicking the float down and overflowing the, the plenum on the bottom of the carburetor. So we put a pressure regulator on it. That one is only running one BSI. She's happy as a lark. She just sings a song, yeah. With the engine back together, I, I think we pushed through every timeline that I thought it was going to be ready, and I really do appreciate the patience of the new owner because uh, we just kind of found things that we wanted to improve upon every step of the way. And eventually we had to um, stop with that because we still have ideas that we'd like to do with this but it's more customization and modification to what we would like and uh, that's for the new owner to do now after everything was tuned in the engine was running beautifully the goal was to have one final run and we'd invite people and we did do that um, in planning that though i don't know exactly how it came about but it was uh, kind of mid-morning and 
uh, I got in touch with Rob and I think I was talking with my dad uh, and we decided to do a twilight run with the Merlin and uh, I managed to get a photographer, an excellent photographer and arrange a drone and uh, we did a, a twilight run that went exceptionally well. We'd, it was absolutely amazing. We ended up doing our final run um, and it went flawlessly as well. Uh, this was on a Sunday morning. We invited some people out to see it. Uh, we were pretty easy on the engine for it. There was no flames to watch or anything like that. So, uh, But it was a beautiful run. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, it was almost sad to see in the video um, that we took from above. You can see Rob, he pulls the mixture back, leans it out, and then really gently uh, kills the magnetos and shuts the engine off. And that was our last run here in Canada. So the next run will be down in New Zealand. Just prior to the run, we had a little bit of a impromptu ceremony for Rob. He, um, he wasn't aware that I was coming, but my father, our CAD designer, um, had been working on a rendering of a uh, Rolls-Royce Merlin and had redesigned all the exhaust to make it look exactly like 7757 with the same, same propeller, same exhaust stubs. And um, we had that printed out for presentation with a nice little phrase at the bottom of it. And uh, a friend of mine, Glenn Winkler, a woodworker who I used to work with, uh, made a really beautiful oak plaque for us to mount the uh, the old camshafts out of 7757 too. And then I, I did some laser work and we did some engraving and all sorts of stuff, put a, another one of those beautiful copper Rolls-Royce logos in the middle of it and presented it to Rob uh, just before our final run. So. It was really wonderful, and I, I couldn't think of a better way to thank Rob for the efforts that he put into this engine. There is no way that this Merlin would be functioning right now without Rob Roy. It was really, I called it the Rob Roy. I'm sure you've seen it on the um, on the valve covers there. I changed Rolls Royce to Rob Roy quite early on because the, the knowledge and experience that Rob brought to the project made it happen. So um, I, I still call her the Rob Roy, but the new owner will no doubt have a new name for her. Um, but uh, Rob came on almost immediately with the Merlin, and uh, I'm honored to have 
had this time to work with him. It's one of my favorite days of the week when Rob's in the shop here, and uh, even more so lately with all the the efforts we've been putting into and the time that Rob's been putting into to get all the systems functioning, get the the, the engine running, and really make sure that everything is good to go for the new owner. I just want to say a big thanks to Ian for letting me work on this thing. Uh, it's just been a marvel. This is a height to my career of doing the engine work sort of thing so far. So yeah, it's just I I really appreciate to being able to be here and, and work on this thing. We get it's great. It's um, I hate to see it go to to New Zealand to be honest with you, but. <laughs>